Friends, did you catch some of the lyrics of that song? Right? So much beauty. Uh, also, though, highlighting awe, mystery, wonder, awestruck wonder, right? At the mention of his name. We sing and we play music as a part of worship because it allows us to connect. It allows lyrics and melodies to get kind of stuck inside and it allows us to be turned to worship, even as we're going about yard work, or as we're going about just our, our day-to-day uh, just duties. Maybe well, there will be a song that comes to mind and we're turned to worship. Well, that's art for you, right? Because art has a way to communicate, to draw us in beyond what is merely rational. I think art is given as a gift. And so this summer, we're actually going to utilize some art as a springboard into reflection about the scriptures and following Jesus. Now, when thinking about following Jesus, I want you to consider the way that the master taught Right? He wove stories and creative narratives that made the invisible visible. He used objects and items from the landscape around in order to announce the character of the inbreaking kingdom of God. And each parable was an invitation to all who had ears to hear, to reflect and to consider the meaning of the story being told and then the implication on their life. It was an invitation and then for them to consider the implication on their life. Sermons are the same, right? Ideally, you hear and you reflect and you are moved to say, well, now what? What does this mean for me as I go from here? And so we're going to use art as a way to delve into some conversations about discipleship. And hopefully it's going to do a similar thing to the parables. Hopefully it invites you to reflect Hopefully it invites you to consider. Hopefully it invites you to consider the meaning of what's being unpacked morning by morning on your faith journey and your life itself. And so now to kick off the making, the Invisible Visible Art and Discipleship series, we're actually going to spend a few weeks with Vincent Van Gogh. Now, while never knowing any success during his life, you may know that in his death, he's become one of the most famous and influential figures in Western art history. He was born March 30th, 1853. Now, Vincent was named for his grandfather, a name that had also been given to his stillborn older brother exactly one year before Vincent was born. Being named after a dead older brother that would do something to anyone, right? Now, Vincent was also a pastor's kid. That too can do something to you. His father, Theodorus Van Gogh, was a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church. And I got to tell you that some church cultures demand a particular adherence and rightness from their ministerial families. I'm sorry because we don't meet that mark. But Vincent's mother lived into this. She was rigid. She was overly religious. She demanded a certain standard from her boys. Those around it noted that it often caused some claustrophobia from any that kind of saw it play out. Reflecting back later, On his childhood, Vincent wrote wrote that his youth was austere and cold and sterile. And yet even still, friends, I don't know if you know this, Vincent was drawn to pastoral ministry. There was something that he saw in his father's vocation. There was something that he experienced that drew him. And in 1878, Vincent prepared for the entrance exam to the University of Amsterdam. He was going to study theology. Then he failed. He was denied entrance. And so then he went and he enrolled in a three-month course at a Protestant missionary school. 
And he failed. And he was rejected. And so then he took a post as a missionary in a coal mining area in Belgium, a place that no one else wanted. He was a warm body. They threw him in. He lasted less than a year. He was fired from his role for undermining the dignity of the priesthood. Now, friends, all the way through, he had sketched and doodled and drew. And in 1880, he changed gears to focus on art. Think about that for a second. An austere, cold, sterile, strict upbringing that sought to meet the outward expectations of those who looked up to his family. And then it was followed by rejection after rejection after rejection when he was merely trying to serve. As we've noted, that will do something to you. Friends, in the beginning of the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we note that from the beginning, God has been in the business of bringing light out of the darkness. Last week, we touched on the fact that God made humanity in his image and likeness. A light bringing God creates image bearers with the potential to shine light into the world. And so from the very beginning, humanity has carried a creative potential to live into light, live into goodness, live into inspiration, and then inspiring those who see, all sourced in God, the ground of being. Yet consistently, humans chose other options. Consistently, we choose other options, other paths, instead of light, darkness, instead of goodness, brokenness, instead of inspiration, Soul-sucking monotony. Now, you may know one of Vincent's most famous paintings is Starry Night. The quiet ta town beneath a swirling sky of stars. Now, this isn't a town found anywhere. It emerged out of Vincent's imagination. You see, Vincent painted in a post-impressionist style, style that sought to communicate more than meets the eye. He sought to make the invisible visible. He painted emotion. He painted feeling. He painted what could not be seen and tried to get it down onto the canvas. Now, the deep blue of the sky was used by Vincent to represent the infinite presence of God. So when you see that deep blue, for Vincent, he's like, God is mysterious. God is big. God is more than we can understand. And then notice the dotting of the yellow. The sky is illuminated. Yellow is Van Gogh's color for sacred love. Now, you may also notice how the divine light of the stars is repeated in the village below. The homes illuminated with that same yellow warmth. For Vincent, God's loving presence is experienced not only in the heavens, but also on earth. Now, friends, take a look near the middle of that painting. Do you notice the one building that does not have any light? From Vincent's perspective, no divine presence, no sense of the sacred love. It's the church there in the middle. No lights coming from the windows, no light coming from the building at all. The darkness of the church speaks of Vincent's judgment on the institutional church. Rather than light, goodness, inspiration, the church he knew was full of icy coldness. The beginning of the book of John, we have this recorded. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, the one who founded the church, 
the one who continues to build the church through the movement of the Spirit, is the life that was light of all mankind. Friends, humanity, and then we, by extension, because we're all a part of humanity, we bear the image of the Creator God, who from the beginning has been in the business of shining light into the darkness. Then as followers of Jesus, the church that bears His name is packed with the potential to bear the same characteristics that came to define Jesus. As people experience the church in general, what would they experience? We have the potential to reflect Christ. We have the potential to be known by the same defining characteristics as the one in whose name we move. What would they experience? Do they experience the word made flesh among us? The light that was the life that was light of all mankind? Or friends, are people in 2022 more often like Vincent, struggling to find God in the confines of institutional religion? Author Sky Jathani says, I fear the contemporary church is losing its ability to inspire. In a world churning with God's wonders, designed to inspire our imaginations and draw our souls heavenward, the programmatic church is dark by comparison. What can we do to light it up again? Maybe a fog machine? A laser light show? A bigger stage that has a bigger band that can be louder? You need a more humorous, charismatic communicator. Bigger budgets, bigger staff teams. What can we do? Well, whatever we can do, we just got to dazzle and draw, right? Dazzle and draw. Friends, these things may draw a crowd, right? They may draw a crowd, but do they contribute to building the kingdom of God? Do they invite consumers of religion to actually become disciples? It's actually a question to consider. There's a more recent painting by uh, pop artist Ron English. This is called Starry Night Urban Sprawl. <laughs> Notice how it replaces the original quaint village with some modern-day architecture of consumerism. Fast food restaurants, Hollywood icons, and notice the church. The church steeple is crowned with the golden arches. And King Kong straddles the roof. Franchised experiences, bigger mind-blowing presentations designed to dazzle and draw. And unlike Van Gogh's Starry Night in Ron English's composition, the church is not dark. Light emerges from every window and door, but is not the sacred yellow of the stars above. Instead, the church repeats the electric white of the franchised stores and restaurants around it. In this painting, it's reflecting the values of earth not the values of the heavens. This church is a corporation. This church leverages marketing. This church is about entertainment. And friends, it's God as a commodity. Ron English in this painting is critiquing the contemporary church as a peddler of mere consumeristic Christianity. A cheapened, shallow version of faith that's meant to appeal, uh, appeal and dazzle. But friends, it never satisfies. It cannot satisfy. Like the McDonald's meal eaten with temporary enjoyment, the result is never good. Right? It fails to nourish, it fails to fill, and it often does something to your bowels. In Matthew 5, 14 and following, this is the Sermon on the Mount. We spent some time here recently. 
Jesus says, and he's talking. Jesus is talking to his disciples and those who have gathered. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Friends, Jesus emerged from obscurity, preaching a countercultural message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. His life and message was one of love and care for the marginalized. From the beginning, Jesus invited his followers to take up their crosses and follow him. Before they knew that he actually meant, take up your cross and follow me. And as they follow him, they get to sacrifice. They get to sacrifice. Think of a consumeristic Christianity. The only thing that counters that is an experience of sacrificial love. One that says God is up to something and I have the opportunity to serve. I get to have my life poured out for those around. Jesus' invitation is deep. His invitation is meaningful. Friends, would that his followers in 2022, that we would take up the mantle again of being a counter-cultural agent for the kingdom of God that's coming into the world. And can we just acknowledge that in 2022 North America, Elijah, you mentioned Pakistan. Pakistan's probably different. But in, here in Canada, we swim in the waters of consumerism. It's the world we live in. We can't get out of it. But friends, there's a difference between living in a consumeristic world and embracing a consumeristic worldview. Right? There is a difference. There's a difference between just going with the flow and being carried downstream and turning and swimming in the direction you know to be right. You are the light of the world. Think about how the earliest Jesus followers lived within the Roman Empire, yet they chose not to bend a knee to Caesar. They saw their citizenship as being in the kingdom of heaven. In a similar way, we're challenged to learn to live within a consumeristic empire, but we choose not to bend a knee to mammon, to commodity consumer Christianity, to wealth, to the pursuit of stuff. Again, consumerism is so pervasive, it's important to have our eyes open to the fact that it's actually competing with the kingdom of heaven for our hearts and imaginations. What do you find captivating? What do you find compelling? What do you wake up to do? What fills you with joy? These notes of the consumeristic world around us are trying to captivate your heart. But friends, just like McDonald's, it may promise much, but it's going to leave us malnourished. It's going to leave us with a weak view of God, a weak understanding of faith, a weak experience of church, and a weak mission to participate in. Friends, one of my prayers for PFC is that we could be a community in which we kindle the imagination of what faith can be. That we'd be a community in which the invisible was made visible through experiences of God in the context of community centered on the life-giving love of Christ. And friends, today, like every day, is the, the invitation is to turn and walk towards Jesus. To walk hand in hand with one another in community, all mobilized by the Spirit of the living God, making the invisible visible. Friends, would you join me this summer as we navigate reflections on art and discipleship, allowing it to stir us up, stir up our imaginations for what Jesus may be doing in us, through us, and around us. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are at work in the world. We thank you that with Jesus, you ignited a countercultural mission 
that is countercultural in whatever empire it's in, whether that be the Roman Empire or the, cons- the, empire cons- the consumeristic empire we currently find ourselves in. May we catch a new imagination of what we're invited into. What does it mean to love sacrificially in our time, in our world, in our families, on our streets, in our neighborhoods, in our town? And I pray that as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, that you would move, that you would use us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.